He said, I want to show you something that's going to change the world. And he walked me to his garage, and in there was an Oldsmobile in about 1947 or 48, something like that. And he said, you see this? It's only got a brake, and it's only got an accelerator. It doesn't have a clutch. And I said, so what? And he said, well, you just take this stick, and you move it here, and you never have to change the gears. And even as a child, I said, well, I bet that's really going to go far. <laughs> that is not a marginal improvement, you see. And so I think the AVE stent at the time was a huge change in a product so that people used it in Europe and permitted the company to live off its European sales in a way that probably is a paradigm that can't be repeated today for any number of reasons. But at the time, it, uh, it, uh, it, it uh, foreclosed on the requirement for B, C, D, F rounds of financing. Well, I was going to say, I know that you spent most of your time on the technology and clinical side at AV. AV seems to us, in retrospect, to be the quintessential medical device success, and innovative technology, successful public offering, um, dramatically successful sale to a large company. Except in one regard, it took no venture capital money uh, in, its, in its funding. That, that, I think, it comes back to what I just said. It was to, uh, uh, to stent technology what Oldsmobile's first automatic transmission was to uh, manual transmission. Today, that analogy holds uh, uh, going forward in that you don't buy one automobile over another because they have automatic transmission, because they all do. So to a certain extent, it's difficult to explain uh, why AVE was so successful in 2004. But in 1994, it was such that whether you liked me or Brad Gendersy or John Miller, and most people didn't, you would use it because it would go where you wanted it to go. <laughs> and yet you were saying to me that, um, I was saying to you that I thought that there must have been a lot of people clamoring to get in on the AVE um, jump on the AV bandwagon, but you said that a lot of people actually predicted that you guys wouldn't survive uh, F your first couple of years. Uh, I, I don't know if I said that to you. I don't Did remember saying that. that. <laughs> Somebody else I must have said that. that. Else no, I, I, uh, I don't think that uh, AVE was too much on, uh, on the radar screen until it started to uh, emerge in Europe at various conferences where... Uh, uh, people grudgingly used it, and I say grudgingly because they, uh, you know, AVE didn't have a lot uh, of money to support uh, this conference and that conference. So it came out of the, um, uh, 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 it came off the shelf only in a demonstration course where somebody was having difficulty with some other modality, and it, it was able to survive uh, because of again its uh, unique product behavior, and. Um, and so I, I think w there are some products uh, that will have a window of opportunity to do that. And then uh, there are advances that naturally take place in the course of industrial development and competition. And this, I'm sure, you know, rings uh, uh, a bell with everyone and is something which we see uh, everywhere and everything. Your, your analogy of the uh, manual shift to the automatic transmission suggests that you're looking for large leaps forward in technology. And I know for the last several years you've been involved in a number of startups. I wonder if you can talk about where you see some promising technology going forward. And One technology that you were involved with in one startup was quantum, which is a drug eluting stent. What, what do you see as the future of drug eluting stents and the future of drugs or, or biologically active agents as parts of cardiovascular device therapy going forward? Well, I, I think uh, that we know the uh, the modality works. We know that if we uh, elude a drug uh, uh, into the area that we've just angioplastied, we can break a cycle of, uh, of um, intracellular events that cause restenosis. Um, I think what will change dramatically is uh, the platform, uh, if not the drug. And, but I think the principles established, and I think we will see more uh, uh, variations on what uh, is going to carry the drug and how that uh, uh, device is going to uh, interface with the, I think you will see uh, 
the, uh, the polymer paradigm that we're now looking at uh, outmoded fairly quickly with some extremely ingenious uh, methods of, of doing the same thing and perhaps with different drugs. Mm -hmm. You're now into areas like uh, vessel tissue engineering and intramyocardial delivery. Talk about some of those as, as promising new areas. And do you look at them as business opportunities, commercial opportunities, or do you see them more as clinical advances and therapeutic advances? Well, I see them as uh, clinical advances. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that, uh, and I've said this to a lot of people in this audience time and time again, I think the jury is still out on intramyocardial delivery. But I do think that, uh, uh, that uh, myoblast therapy, active, vasoactive and myoactive peptides, uh, and um, progenitor stem cells uh, in some form or another, or another will have some role or can have some role in either myocardial or angiogenesis. And uh, whereas I've been looking at this for about four years now, uh, I don't see that this has been adjudicated uh, negatively. Uh, at first it seemed very far out and then uh, uh, it seemed to drag. Now I, I, I have the feeling that um, there's a little more positive information than negative, although it's a highly speculative and a difficult uh, thing to imagine, but so was coronary angiography in 1962. Mm -hmm. So I think intramyocardial drug delivery or intramyocardial therapy of one sort or another uh, will emerge uh, with uh, some polemic about the method of delivery and, and considerable polemic about the efficacy of what is delivered, uh, but I think we're going to see uh, a great deal of that uh, in the next uh, five years or so. And I think that uh, one of the things, I, 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 I did tell you this, uh, that um, since AVE uh, 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 moved me uh, unjustifiably to some semi-oracular status, I've seen 115 <laughs> business plans since AVE and I didn't see one before AVE unless I wrote it myself uh, or contributed to it. Uh, and um, I've gotten involved in about a dozen and uh, now I'm maybe actively involved in about three or four. Uh, uh, fortunately, most of them have uh, uh, had technologies that have been either uh, uh, bought out or, uh, or still ongoing. But uh, I'm interested in things like tissue engineering, where I see a, um, a technology that will provide uh, blood vessels for arteriovenous uh, shunts for saphenous uh, vein grafts in a way that I hope someday will uh, provide autologous internal mammary arteries for people. Mm -hmm. So uh, those, ag again, are, in my mind, things that uh, uh, kind of go back to the uh, automatic shift. Well, Simon, sorry, can I take you back to the coronary arteries? So, so uh, there's, I mean, with drug-coded stents, we kind of have solved the problem. Is that, is that right, or, or is, there, is there something more to do with coronaries? I think there's a lot more to do with coronaries. Uh, if we just go off the top of my head to total occlusions and to acute myocardial infarction, uh, I think that uh, the removal of tissue is, uh, and the removal of thrombus and the cleaning out of saphenous vein grafts in a near 100% satisfactory way is something that will come. Uh, the uh, same disadvantages that we see with protection devices and dealing with grafts and leaving microthrombi in acute myocardial infarction I think we're on the verge of seeing that attacked in a way that will uh, be able to remove uh, or prevent microemboli. I think it'll be a major, uh, major change in terms of, of, um, uh, of interventional coronary, uh, percutaneous coronary intervention. And I also uh, uh, have seen and uh, uh, at least on the drawing board, uh, a mechanism for dealing with total occlusion that is going to, uh, if that doesn't work, something like it will. Mm -hmm. And I think that also will expand the uh, horizon of, uh, of percutaneous intervention uh, tremendously. Uh, and not to be forgotten is that while we're doing all of this, 
uh, we've seen a remarkable improvement in medical therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you just take something like statin drugs, I think there are people that we were treating with galloping atherosclerosis, whereby if we didn't get restenosis, we got new lesion after new lesion after new. We don't see that as much anymore, and I think that's because of, of medical therapy. So, so that was the next thing I was going to ask you. I can't resist. Uh, uh, vulnerable plaque, vulnerable sections of arteries, is that, is that a device solution in your mind? Where, where, where are we going with that? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I think it's a really good question, and I think that there's a lot of uh, thought and money being uh, given to it, uh, but I don't have the answer myself. <laughs> but I think it's a really important <coughs> question, and I think that uh, uh, my guess is that we will find a uh, a way of uh, suddenly getting a breakthrough with what that what, what a vulnerable plaque is all about and how to identify it. But well, I don't know how to do that mm -hmm. right now. Well, you think about innovative technology, some like vulnerable plaque or drug eluting stents or tissue engineering bring kind of biologically active agents and, and kind of represent a new horizon or a new realm for medical device companies and others seem more mechanical, chronic total occlusions, you know, are, are kind of mechanical, go back to the heyday when devices were simply a, a more efficient guide wire or a better balloon. Can you still get excited about the ones that are purely mechanical devices but that help physicians do procedures better as opposed to the ones that have this kind of more complex biology attached to them? Well, I, I like them both, but I can tell you that in June I uh, was in Dr. De La Fuente's laboratory in Argentina and I know I uh, did a couple of cases of moribund people with obstructions of major vessels, elderly people, near shock in, with acute myocardial infarction, and was able to take out the entire clot and see a change in hemodynamics that I can't say was as exciting as uh, you know, the first 10 angioplasties I did, but I must say that that made me feel as though uh, to close the book on uh, mechanical engineering solutions to intervention is a very short-sighted way of looking at things. <laughs> so, as you look forward going, I know one of the issues you had in 1978 was that the instrumentation you were using to do these first coronary angioplasties was so primitive and so crude at the time. And you mentioned to me that there's just been such tremendous progress, it's like going from Orville right to the Concord in the last 20 years. As you look out for the next 20 years, does, do those kinds of advances help build, or have we really kind of reached a, a golden age of, of interventional therapies um, as we stand right now? Is there, is there room for as much improvement in the, last, in the next several years as there have been in the, la in the past several years? Well, if you uh, listen to Eric Topol, we're <laughs> going to just go back to medicine and stop all of this. I think that uh, uh, it's a little premature to say that we are going to, in the next few years, in the foreseeable future, uh, find a way to so uh, efficiently treat uh, atherosclerosis medically either to prevent it or to uh, reverse it, that we're not going to need a tremendous improvement in intervention. And if you go back to uh, Orville Wright and supersonic jet travel, I would point out to you that uh, NASA just tested a ramjet engine that could probably uh, take an airplane around the world in three hours. <laughs> so, you know, the fact that we have supersonic uh, a jet capability that for many reasons we didn't commercialize yet, you're going to see that commercialized and then uh, sometime even beyond your lifetime, you'll, uh, your children will probably see a ramjet go from Washington to, uh, 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 to Washington in three hours. <laughs> so I think the same thing will happen with intervention. There isn't, let me, let, let me just summarize by saying that uh, in, uh, since 1977, since Grunzig's original angioplasty, if you look at percutaneous intervention every five years, you probably would say, God, we're not doing what we did five years ago. And that's true today, so why wouldn't it be true in 2009 and so on? <laughs> Great. Well, Dr. Tesher, thank you very much for uh, sharing your insights, and uh, thank you for being with us on this program today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.